Welcome to this video on the history of The Awakened from the tabletop role-playing game Mage The Ascension. The history of The Awakened is in many ways the history of humanity. Unlike vampires, werewolves, and changelings, The Awakened, will workers, or mages have no single origin, no mythical progenitor from whom to claim descent. But there is speculation aplenty. Adam, Lilith, Seth, Thoth, Isis, Imhotep, the Buddha, Huang Di, the Yellow Emperor, Manu, and a host of other offerings that usually elevate the prestige of the proponent by claiming that said progenitor is part of their mystic lineage. Ultimately, that lofty title of first mage in history is irrelevant. Whoever they were, they are long since gone. And magic, true magic, has long since been a mostly solitary practice. Magic is best thought of as a massive cosmic river with forks, confluences, tributaries, and gaps. And from those river forks came shaman, priests, astrologers, fortune tellers, herbalists, craftsmen, enchanters, and warriors who, through tools and methods, bent reality to their will. Of the current loose organization of mages, the Council of Nine Traditions, the oldest tradition is the Akashic Brotherhood, or as it was known during its founding over 6,000 years ago, the Akashayana Sangha. Fortunately, the Akashics were quite content to sit on their particular mountain in Tibet and ignore the rest of the world as they meditated and occasionally punched their way to ascension. The first effort to bind various awakened of differing practice together was in Egypt in the 15th century BC. Thutmose III gathered every mage he could from Iberia to China and divided his newly gathered assembly into two orders, the Reed of Jehudi and the Cup Bearers of Aset. The Reed was made up of mathematicians, masons, and artificers. The Cup Bearers were healers, priests, and mystics. And instantly, conflict was had, not only because of differing methods, but the Egyptians tended to look down on their foreign guests as unsophisticated, not quite far along as the greatest civilization in the world, and therefore the greatest mages in the world. After a time, they all went back to their respective corners of said world. Two later traditions would claim to have originated from the Reed of Jehudi and the Cup Bearers of Aset, the Order of Hermes and the Celestial Chorus, respectively. About five centuries later, in the 10th century BC, during the reign of the Israelite king Shalemo bin David, or Solomon if you prefer, some thoughtless person, variously identified as Shaitan, Baal, or Set, unleashed a horde of approximately 10,000 honest to badness demons on the Middle East. King Solomon, being the wisest man in the world, figured he should call on the experts to deal with this. Once again, mages unified this time to slay or bind the majority of the demons. Along with King Solomon, the effort was led by two others, Abana Tasheret, an Egyptian mage who would lead the mystical house of the Sestat, and an Arabian demon slayer by the name of al Ashrad the Mighty. Hmm. Now I don't intend to spoil anything, but check out my video on the vampires of Clan Asamite if you want to learn more about al Ashrad and his later adventures. King Solomon's own work, or at least work attributed to him, would be maintained by Jewish Kabbalists through the centuries as various grimoires and magical treatises. Meanwhile, over in India, a terrible misunderstanding was about to take place. The Akashayana Sangha, the Akashic Brotherhood, traveled to the subcontinent to spread their doctrine and learn from the Indian death mages who studied karma, the Wheel of Ages, and reincarnation. Unfortunately, the Akashics took issue with their practice of killing the sick and diseased. A death mage named Ranjit was accidentally killed by an Akashic named White Tiger. The six-century-long series of wars between the Akashics and the Indian death mages was both a tragedy and a triumph. During the Himalayan wars, the Akashics and death mages alike died, but given both sides' knowledge of reincarnation, the slain could be reborn, not only with the knowledge of their previous lives, but of their killer and a desire for revenge. As the war dragged on, the spiritually and psychologically damaged mages slowly began turning to infernalism or becoming marauders, insane mages who could no longer distinguish between reality and their imagination. Some Akashics had quite enough of the Himalayan wars prior to their official end and wandered south and west into Afghanistan and Persia, 
where they encountered orders of dervish mystics, happily spinning their way to enlightenment in the desert. This meeting went better than their previous one with the death mages had. In 514 BC, in an event known as the Night of Fauna, one of the dervishes performed their typical dance, while an Akashic performed Akata from their mystic art, Do. Eventually, the two movements became one, along with the two practitioners, fusing into a single being, the Kawaja al-Akbar. Yes, mages can in fact do the fusion dance. In that moment, all in attendance attained unity, oneness, awareness of all things. The moment ended as the Kawaja al-Akbar split back into the two men who had created it, but they and all witnesses to the event were forever changed. This was the birth of the tradition known as the al e Batin, the subtle ones, masters of correspondence and champions of unity. The 6th century BC produced one of the most important mages to ever live, Pythagoras, a mathematician and mystic whom a number of traditions owe their practices to. He was also quite possibly the first technomancer in history. Pythagoras was able to blend Greek and Egyptian mysticism with mathematics, geometry, and acoustics to such an extent that several of his disciples considered him to be a god before he died. The Order of Hermes, the Celestial Chorus, the Cult of Ecstasy, and the al e Batin each took large chunks of Pythagoras' workings for their own. What is it that Arthur C. Clarke said? Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic? Anyway, also during the 6th century, Rome threw off the rule of the Etruscan kings and became a republic. By the end of the millennium, Rome was an empire, and one of the most important to ever exist, and not just for human history, but for mages. The Roman period saw some of the most interaction between mages of differing practices since the reed and cupbearers of ancient Egypt. Unfortunately, it also saw a dramatic and petty warring between these rival mages. At Rome's heart was a feud between the Messianic Voices, the first sect of Christian mages to exist against the Mithraic Singers, a fusion of Pythagorean mysticism and Roman mystery cult. The feud was brought to an end when Theodosius declared Christianity to be the official religion of the empire and the Mithraics retreated underground. Greek hermetics quarreled with Mercury cults and Egyptian Thothians. Dionysian Bacchanates warred against the witches of Hecate. Celtic priests argued over which way the sacrificial goat was supposed to point on the altar, and so on. In the 8th century, a mage named Bonisagis practiced the arts of the cult of Mercury and solitude in the Pyrenees Alps. He developed a system of magic based on the cult's practices, the pinnacle of which was the Parma Magica, the Shield of Magic, which allowed a mage to protect themselves from the workings of other mages. As his name might suggest, Bonisagis was a good sage an honorable man, and an archmage in his own right. In 731 AD, Trianoma, a prophetess who had been a member of the cult of Mercury in the days of Rome, contacted Bonisagis. She told him that she had a vision that if the old Hermetic, Mercurial, and Thothian traditions were not united, they would be lost forever. But mages, and not without some justification, feared treachery from one another. Trianoma believed that Bonisagis Parma Magica was the key to bringing the mages together long enough to form an agreement. She persuaded Bonisagis to share the Parma Magica spell with others. Following 30 years of diplomacy and negotiation, 12 masters, well, 10 masters and two apprentices who kind of snuck in on their master's reputation, met in the German city of Durenmar to create the Pax Hermetica, joining their houses into a single body, the Order of Hermes. Oh, and those two apprentices were named Titulus and Tremir. He'll be important later. Following the founding of the Order of Hermes came the reign of the Frankish king and first Holy Roman Emperor, Charlemagne. Crucial to Charlemagne's successful reign were his twelve palatines, or paladins, as the Latin word was anglicized. The palatines shared the name with a secret society of mages who acted as warriors, priests, and mystics during the Dark Ages. The Palatines battled demons, infernalists, vampires, monsters, and other mages. These Palatine knights would play a critical role in the history of mages later. Meanwhile, the al e Batin kept busy warring with various infernalist mages in Persia and Arabia. The worst of this number was Al-Malik Al-Mujin ibn Iblis. 
Now, you know a guy is bad news when he calls himself the son of Satan. Or he's just trying way too hard. But Al-Malik was the genuine article, and sent his demon soldiers to slaughter entire villages and tribes. Swift death was probably the most merciful fate his horde inflicted on their victims. But a Batin archmage rose to oppose Al-Malik, El-Assad Al-Gabar, the Splendid Lion, who was also a convert to the new religion of the region, Islam. El-Assad put together an army of Batini and a dozen other sects and laid siege to Al-Malik's brass fortress, Irem. El-Assad was victorious, though at heavy cost. The blood of his own forces ran so deep that it formed a lake in the desert, forever known as the Oasis of Eternal Bliss. Irem was scoured from the earth, and Al-Malik's ashes and soul were magically sealed in a bronze urn that could not be opened until the day the seas boiled to dust. Unlike the temporary alliance under Solomon during the 10,000 Jinn Plague, El assads alliance were united not only by a common enemy, but also by a common faith. Many of the participants had converted to Islam. The Batini convinced the righteous Ghazi, the House of the Crescent Moon, the Dervishes, and the other smaller sects that they would be stronger if they combined their mystical and martial resources against infernal threats. The participants linked the nodes of their various temples, chapters, and chantries together to strengthen one another in a magical network known as the Web of Faith. At its height, the web stretched from Iberia all the way to Indonesia. Needless to say, despite these varying efforts to consolidate resources, not everything was sweetness and light. Despite their power, mages are, more or less, mortal, and occasionally use their power in service to mortal interests. Christian mages feuded with Muslim mages, Muslim mages against Hindu and Zoroastrian mages, pagan mages against Christian and Muslim mages, and so on. The attacks in India by Muslim jihadists were so destructive that mages of differing sects aligned to form the Ashtika to resist them. In 1200 AD, the Order of Hermes, to its horror, discovered that Tremere had not only turned himself into a vampire, but was also plotting to spread vampirism throughout his house and then into the entire order. The order expelled House Tremere entirely and declared a wizard's march against them, the Masasa War. House's flambeau and Titulus prosecuted the war with a vengeance. Titulus even went so far as to align itself with another of Tremere's enemies, the vampires of Clan Zemitsi, in order to destroy them. Of course, within the order, mistrust and suspicion ran rampant. Those assigned to police the order against such treachery were caught off guard by the Tremere, and were so regarded as either being in league with the Tremere or grossly incompetent. The Masasa War dragged on in other mage sects, including the Palatine Knights, who regarded the Titleist alliance with the monstrous Zemitsi as intolerable. By the war's end, numerous masters and apprentices were dead, chantries were lost or despoiled, and whatever trust existed within the Pax Hermetica had been broken. Outside of the order, members of the Palatine Knights and the Messianic Voices regarded the Hermetics as little better than the Tremere. But the Order of Hermes had given birth to an even worse problem, though it was unnoticed at the time. The Hermetic House Ex Miscellanea contained smaller sects that did not justify the grant of house status in their own right. One of these sects was a group known as the Craft Masons, who practiced the arts of sacred geometry and artifice. Around the same time as the Order discovered that the Tremere were vampires, the Craft Masons had a quiet meeting amongst themselves to discuss the future of magic. Eventually, a consensus was reached that magic should not be held by a small, insular elite, but should be codified and shared with the masses in order to improve their lives. It was hardly noticed when the Craft Masons withdrew from the Order of Hermes, but ten years later, the Craft Masons, in unison with a confederation of tradesmen, merchants, and financiers known as the High Guild, attacked the Hermetic Chantry of Mistridge in southern France. The craft masons, for the first time, brought cannons to bear against the Chantry walls. The siege continued for several weeks until Grimgroth, a mage secretly in league with Tremere, lowered the Chantry's defenses, allowing the cannons to bring the walls down. The craft masons' force of professional soldiers and angry peasants killed every hermetic mage within, except Grimgroth, who managed to escape in the confusion. The craft masons' victory, tainted though it may have been, allowed them to gather more allies to their cause. By 1325, the craft masons stood at the forefront of a legitimate threat to all mages everywhere. 
they destroyed another hermetic chantry, the White Tower of Languedoc. In the ruin of that haven of magic, they summoned their allies, men of science, philosophy, trade, and war. On March 25th, they issued the Declaration of the White Tower, the founding document of the Order of Reason. They swore that the world would not be governed by magic or by supernatural beasts, but by order, reason, and humanity alone. Though the craft masons had been fighting mages for over a century, this marks the official beginning of the Ascension War. And the army that would fight the war on behalf of the Order of Reason was the Cabal of Pure Thought, a faction of the Knights Palatine that had broken away to join the Order. The Cabal's motto was One World, One God specifically the god of the Roman Catholic Church. The cabal of pure thought tore through witches and pagans of England and Northern Europe like a storm. Isolation had once been the witches' greatest protection. Now it was their greatest weakness as the cabal picked them off one by one with overwhelming numbers and force. And the cabal was just as ruthless with heretics as it was with pagans. The mages of the messianic voice, despite their piety, would not be suffered in the Cabal's perfect world. The voices hid themselves in catacombs and monasteries to avoid the Cabal's crusade. At the beginning of the 15th century, a seer from Persia by the name of Shazar received a prophetic vision, allegedly in the same place as the Khawaja al-Akbar had come to the Akashics and Dervishes centuries before. It told Shazar that he must unify the mages of the world in a single brotherhood, elsewise magic would be lost forever. A tall order, to say the least. Shazar first traveled to the al Ibatan, then to the newly established Chakravanti, a tradition of death mages from India, Greece, and Africa who were all receptive to his idea. But Europe would be a much trickier hurdle to overcome, but Shazar had foreseen that he would have allies in his quest. The Cabal's war against the pagans and heretics of Europe had created them. The first was a woman named Nightshade a witch who had survived an attack by the Cabal, but had lost her friends and family. Among the survivors, she built another family, one she wanted to protect more than she wanted revenge against the Cabal. The second was Bishop Valorin, a member of the Messianic Voices, who the Cabal had denounced as a heretic to the Inquisition, and was forced into hiding as a simple monk. He had had a vision given by the Archangel Gabriel of a choir of thousands, each singing in their own voice, but united in a single celestial song. Last but not least was Master Baldric LaSalle Bonnie Titulus of the Order of Hermes, arguably a mage who was perfect in mind, body, and spirit. But as the perfect man, he had run out of challenges both mundane and mystical. Shazar, by diplomacy and the occasional bit of trickery, convinced these three to meet him in the ruins of Mistridge. Now Shazar had never been to Mistridge, nor had he heard of it, his visions led him to where he was meant to be. There, Shazar told the three mages that the destiny of all mages was unity, but if they did not join together, the order of reason would do to them individually what they had done to Mistridge. This was the first any of them had heard of the order of reason, which had, until that point, acted under the cover of other organizations and conflicts. The Hermetics had always assumed that Mistridge was destroyed in the Albigensian Crusade, possibly at the behest of Clan Tremere. The witches and messianic voices believed that their single enemy had been the Inquisition. These forces had been the hand of their destruction, but not the will behind it. After months of discussion, debate, and heated argument, they agreed to a plan to form a council of mages. They would depart to gather every mage they could and return to Mistridge in nine years. Now Shazar, Nightshade, Valorin, and LaSalle were the most notable mages present at the first conclave at Mistridge, but not the only ones. During the meetings, Nightshade met a group of German folk mages led by a red-haired giant of a man by the name of William Groth. Like Nightshade's group, they were survivors of an attack by the Cabal of Pure Thought. They overcame the language barrier and developed a deep friendship, then fell in love. Nightshade and Groth were married in a mystic ceremony that united them, heart and soul, along with their two groups. They agreed to name this new sect the Verbene, the Sacred Branches because they were two sacred branches, grafted together that would one day grow into a mighty tree as tall as the heavens and as broad as the world. After their marital and, um, physical union, Nightshade traveled west and Groth went east in search of more mages. Nightshade first went to Iceland, 
then Wales, following the routes used by the Vikings to reach North America. She and her band wandered the Americas speaking to priests, shamans, and medicine men, recruiting more branches to join the Verbene. Groth traveled to the Balkans, then Russia, then China, where he met with the Akashic Brotherhood. He disappeared somewhere in Siberia. Nightshade, at the time in Africa, claimed that her husband died as she felt his heart stop beating. William Groth is marked as the first martyr of the Council of Nine, and the Verbena still honor his memory. Bishop Valoran, a gifted public speaker, was charged by what he believed to be divine revelation and purpose. He shared his vision of the Archangel Gabriel to the Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Armenians, Arians, Nestorians, Copts, and others. He even recruited the righteous Ghazi and the Vishnu Dada Dada. Shazar returned to Persia, where his followers had been busy gathering ecstatic sects from Asia, Africa, and Europe. Shazar laid down the Code of Ananda, the code and law of the Saihagia, or alternately, the Seers of Kronos, the tradition that would later become the Cult of Ecstasy. Master LaSalle did the least travel but had the most difficult task. Persuasive as LaSalle was, his fellow hermetics had been thoroughly bloodied from the Masasa War and had no desire to deal with magical traditions they regarded, quite plainly, to be their inferiors. LaSalle spent the next nine years in a seemingly endless deluge of meetings, debates, and lectures to promote Shazar's vision. He killed at least a dozen hermetic mages in personal duels to bring the rest into line. Despite what LaSalle told them about Mistridge and the Order of Reason, many hermetics believed that there was nothing that could truly threaten them. But in 1448, the Order of Reason temporarily shattered the hermetics' arrogance when they attacked the hermetics' prime chantry of Doisestep. Before Doisetep, the Order of Reason attacked under the cover of some other conflict. But this siege was open war, and the Order of Reason threw everything they had at the Hermetics, from artillery to clockwork soldiers to faith-wielding Knights Templar. The five-month siege ended when the Hermetics were able to reactivate the ancient wards used to transport the Chantry, and even then, they had built over the structure in such a way as they could only move half of it to safety. This left the other half, including apprentices and servants, to be massacred by the Order of Reason's forces. The second gathering at Mysteridge was much better attended than the first. Over a hundred mages were present, including a delegation from the Americas. Unfortunately, the Order of Reason decided that whatever was going on at Mysteridge, they needed to destroy it. They marched from Doisetep to Mysteridge at best speed, armed with hand cannons, Greek fire, clockwork tanks, knights, and airships. Go hard or go home. The mystics did their best to fortify and defend Mistridge, but were badly outnumbered and overpowered. Their destruction was certain save for one thing, the Order of Hermes. Their defeat at Doisetep had humbled them, well, as much as a mage can be humbled. The hermetics had made pacts with over a dozen dragons. Yes, flying, scaly death tanks are the great equalizer, and don't let anyone else tell you different. The dragons burned, melted, and chewed their way through a good portion of the Order of Reason's forces, giving the mages time to regroup and counterattack. They drove the artificers from Mistridge. After the battle, the mages decided that it was no longer safe to meet in the Tellurian, and began work constructing a pocket realm in the spirit world, powered by nodes from around the world. This moon-sized realm was called Horizon, and became the seat of the Council of Nine mystic traditions. The work took nine more years. The first meeting at Horizon, the Grand Convocation, hosted anywhere from 500 to 1,000 mages, including some sects believed to have been lost, such as the Mithraic Singers, and a few that no one had invited from Australia and Polynesia, but had learned of the Convocation through spirit messengers and other means. The Grand Convocation of enlightened, spiritually attuned will workers quickly devolved into a session of the Ukrainian Parliament, including heated arguments, fist fights, and a few magic duels. The small groups wanted equal representation. The large groups wanted proportional representation. One hermetic mage proposed that everyone join the Order of Hermes, but was shouted back into his seat. Eventually, compromise was achieved at nine council seats, one for each sphere of magic, which was another argument. With a number of seats decided, then followed the question of how to fill them. Of course, the Hermetics wanted a seat all to themselves. The Ali Batin thought that the seat should be divided according to region. 
the Verbene, the Messianic Voices, the Chakravanti, and the Seers of Kronos had just relatively recently formed a collective identity and were unwilling to be divided up by region. The Akashic Brotherhood was the most powerful and largest sect in Asia, so they, like the Hermetics and the Batin, were guaranteed a seat. So the power players got the big chairs, the Order of Hermes, the Ali Batin, the Akashic Brotherhood, the Messianic Voices, the Verbene, the Chakravati, and the Seers of Kronos. That left two seats on the council. And here's where the skullduggery came into play. There was a small sect of European alchemists in attendance at the Grand Convocation, most notable for having defected from the Order of Reason. They pulled the important people into a back room and offered to sell everything they knew about the Order of Reason in exchange for a seat on the council. The deal was made, and the Solificati, as they were thereafter known, literally bought their way into power. The last seat was the result of a compromise with the shamanistic and spirit-talking traditions that had not joined the Verbene. This tradition became known as the Dream Speakers. In honor of their newly formed unity, the council appointed a group of mages from each of their traditions to rally mages to the council and fight against the Order of Reason. This group was known as the First Cabal. The deeds of the First Cabal were recorded by the Hermetic mage Porthos Fitz Empress in the Testament of the First Cabal. But history has remembered the First Cabal's downfall more than their successes. In 1470, just four years after the establishment of the First Cabal, they were betrayed by their own leader, Helial Teomim of the Solificati. Pro tip, never trust a guy whose name is Lucifer, or the Hebrew variant. The Cabal of Pure Thought killed three of the mages and tortured the fourth to death. When Teomim's treachery was exposed, he was brought back to Horizon to face judgment. He denied having fallen to infernalism or madness. He insisted in his defense that his betrayal was necessary to unite the traditions against their common enemy, the Order of Reason. But Teomim was sentenced to execution by Gilgal, which is possibly the worst thing that can be done to a mage. The right of Gilgal not only severs a mage from their avatar, but it kills the mage and destroys their soul so that they can never again reincarnate. The Solificati were completely disgraced and subsequently disbanded. Some joined the Order of Hermes as House Ex Miscellanea. Some returned to the Order of Reason, thereby proving to their critics that the alchemist had been traitors all along. Shazar was shaken by his inability to foresee Teomim's betrayal of the First Council and withdrew into a drug-induced dream from which he never awoke. Master LaSalle fought off an attempt by a hermetic faction who wished to withdraw from the council, but died from his wounds. Nightshade managed to stave off a Verbene civil war between feuding mages who wanted to dictate what true paganism was to all the others. Bishop Valorin managed to hold the celestial chorus together, though internally they fractured into dozens of sects, and the Akashic Brotherhood were beset in China by the Wu Lung, the dragon wizards, with whom they had been feuding since the Qin Dynasty. But in spite of it, all their conflicts and outside interests, the traditions managed to hold together. Now, if you're wondering why the Order of Reason didn't take this opportunity to destroy the tradition mages once and for all, the answer is they had their own internal problems. Or, more accurately, an identity crisis. Despite the noble intentions of the craft masons that the power of the cosmos should reside in the hands of the common man, Certain factions within the Order had reached the conclusion that humanity might be too irresponsible to handle the wonders that they warred against and wielded. Perhaps it was best for humanity to be guided by an enlightened few, a benevolent but stern elite that would teach and lead humanity on the path to collective ascension. Of course, the craft masons would never come around to this way of thinking. They venerated mankind too much according to their fellow members. So, the High Guild, the Cabal of Pure Thought, and the Secretive Seraphi conspired with each other, and in 1670, they wiped out the Craft Masons to the last man. With the Craft Masons safely in the dustbin of history, the other conventions separated and went about their various projects to promote science and reason. By the 1830s, the Order had decided that secularism was to be humanity's future, and the Cabal of Pure Thought was given an ultimatum, renounce God or join the Craft Masons as a footnote in the Order's history. Some of the Gabrielites accepted this new paradigm. Others resisted and were destroyed. 
The rest went into hiding. In 1851, at the Grand Exposition in London, the Order of Reason reorganized itself into the Technocratic Union. Their mantra was, one world, one order, one truth. The Union swam in the wake of European imperialism like sharks, devouring anything they could. The technocratic hammer fell especially hard on the dream speaker tradition, who struggled to preserve their native cultures and practices in the face of the so-called civilizing influence. After the British suppressed the Sepoy Rebellion, the Chakravanti, now called the Euthanatoi, were talking loudly about abandoning the council. The Akashic Brotherhood was embittered by the division of China, and the Ali Batin, ever the champions of unity, coaxed the secessionists back from the edge of the cliff that they were about to leap from. But all was still not well within the technocratic camp either. During the Victorian age, the legacy of the craft masons was taken up by a faction within the Union, the Utopians, who, as the name might suggest, wanted to create a perfect world free of war, crime, disease, ignorance, and fear. Essentially, Edward Bellamy's looking backward. The other side of the coin wanted to create a perfect society as well, but one of total order and control. A world of uniformity, conformity, and hegemony, to be guided by an enlightened few based on their obviously superior intellects and training. Basically, Plato's Republic, dialed up to 11. At the dawn of the 20th century, a group of technocrat utopians, the Electrodyne engineers, felt so strongly about the matter that they defected from the Union with a little help from the Order of Hermes in order to fill the vacant seat on the council left by the Solificati. The engineers supported the theory of luminiferous ether, which had been discredited by the Michelson-Morley experiment and later by Einstein's special theory of relativity. Nonplussed by the actions of the Union to shift the paradigm away from their pet theory, the Electrodyne engineers renamed themselves the Sons of Ether and continued building their mechanical servitors, time machines, Frankensteins, and other wonders. The other traditions looked at the Sons of Ether with a bit of concern and wondered if the Council was going to suffer another betrayal from the seat of matter. World War I nearly doomed the Council of Nine, albeit indirectly. The end of the war meant the end of the sick man of Europe, the Ottoman Empire. As the European powers rushed to carve up the Turkish holdings, the Ali Batin suddenly, after centuries of relative safety, finally learned what it was like to have the hand of the technocratic union squeezing their collective throat. By 1922, the Ali Batin withdrew from the council and disappeared back into the Middle East to attend the fight against the technocracy on its own. World War II and the events leading up to it were, to put plainly, an embarrassment for the traditions and the technocrats. The technocrats who were obsessed with perfect order found the rise of totalitarian states to be proof that the consensus of humanity was moving in their preferred direction, despite the eccentricities of the men leading those movements towards the total state. The Axis powers had its fair share of tradition mages who joined their cause, whether out of misguided national loyalty or for the opportunity to practice their own unique brands of barbarism. The overwhelming volume of human death and suffering brought the Nefandi crawling out from under their rocks. The Nefandi are mages, like the traditions and the technocrats, despite the technocrats' protest to the contrary. But the Nefandi are mages whose avatars have been inverted, turned inside out. They do not seek ascension. They want to descend and to take the entire world with them, whether that means hell on earth or oblivion is interpretation dependent, but the Nefandi are not tragic. They are not misunderstood. They have no greater desire than to inflict as much destruction and misery on the world as possible. Matters were not helped by many mages and technocrats being secretly corrupted to the Nefandi cause. By 1944, Europe had become such a slaughterhouse that the Nefandi had enough energy to throw open a massive gateway to whatever nether realm their dark gods sleep in and invite them to earth for a little snack. For the first time in history, the traditions and the technocrats stopped trying to kill each other long enough and turn their considerable power against the Nefandi. A force of the best and brightest from the traditions and the technocrats attacked the Nefandi outside of Berlin, just as the Nefandi were enacting their great ritual. Then, at the last moment, the Nefandi's power failed them. Like, someone just flipped a switch, and boom, everything stopped working. 
No one is certain exactly why and, at that moment, no one cared. The combined tradition and technocrat strike force killed nearly every Nafandi present. World War II had made the technocrats more paranoid than before. The internal schism between Allied and Axis technocrats was bad enough. On top of that, the world very nearly came to an end right under their noses. But what disturbed the Union most was the number of technocrats who fell prey to the siren song of the Infernal, something that no rational mind should have ever entertained. The Union was dealt another unexpected blow when its Information Analysis Convention, the Virtual Adepts, abandoned the Union in 1956. The Adepts came to prominence when Charles Babbage created the Difference Engine, and later the Analytical Engine, allowing for the collection and processing of larger quantities of information than ever before. The Adepts were hotshot theorists in the Union who studied not only information, but how to transmit it. Telegraphs, radios, television. A few even played around with telepathy and memory transferal. The Adepts were mainly centered in the United States and Britain, before the Second World War, they had loudly lobbied against the factions that were promoting totalitarianism. The alliance between the Union and the Traditions was thanks to coordination between the Virtual Adepts and the Sons of Ether, who had left the back channels of communication open, even after the Etherites defected decades before. The shattering point between the Virtual Adepts and the Technocratic Union was an adept by the name of Alan Turing. Alan Turing was a British mathematician, logician, computer scientist, mathematical biologist, and virtual adept archmage. He was also a homosexual at a time when being one was against the law. After he had been charged with public indecency, the adepts believed, at the behest of his enemies in the Union, he went to work privately on computing, artificial intelligence, and virtual reality. In 1954, Turing successfully created a subdimension formed entirely of information and accessible by computer, the digital web. Unfortunately for Turing, his avatar became lost in the digital web, leaving his body, for all intents and purposes, dead. When the Union covered up Turing's greatest success as death by suicide, it was the last straw for the virtual adept who left the Union in 1956. In 1961, the Virtual Adepts joined the Traditions and took the council seat left open by the al e -Batin. The Traditions were feeling pretty good about themselves at this point. The Technocratic Union, which had decided to cut down to one word this time, the technocracy, was pissed beyond all belief. Before the Technocrats had wanted to quietly purge the Traditions according to their timetable. After the Virtual Adepts' departure, they were through with subtlety and prepared for all-out shadow war. Men in black, cyborg killers, super soldiers, focused energy weapons, you name it, they pulled it off the assembly line to use against the traditions. The Archmages of Horizon in turn threw hundreds of adepts and disciples into the technocracy's path for nearly four decades, the so-called Ascension War. In 1998, the Horizon Chantry was nearly destroyed by a group of rebel mages led by a mage calling himself the Ascension Warrior. This sparked a civil war within the Hermetic Chantry of Doisetep, as masters accused one another of being behind the Ascension Warrior's attack on Horizon. The civil war between Hermetic Archmages nearly blew a hole in the Umbra and the Tellurian, but was contained to the Shard Realm of Forces by Porthos Fitz Empress. But these were only the appetizers to the main course. In June of 1999, Zapatha Shura, the progenitor of the vampire clan Ravnos, awoke from torpor in India and began, quite literally, tearing reality apart by simply walking around. Vampires were eating each other. People were suffering psychotic breaks around the world. Corpses were rising from their graves and just strolling around. Floods, fires, and several other fun phenomenon that only crop up when the world is about to go kaput. Needless to say, the technocrats weren't about to let Zapatha Shura stroll his happy ass around Bangladesh unchallenged. The technocracy authorized a fun little project called Code Ragnarok to combat the antediluvian. As per technocratic protocols under Ragnarok, all funds were diverted, all weapons permitted, and all technocrat and civilian casualties were considered acceptable losses. Dozens of frontline awakened operatives, unawakened soldiers, and hit marks were sent into the storm created by the Quasian Bodhisattvas to fight Zapatha Shura and never returned. 
The technocrats tried to direct their orbital solar mirrors against the Pathashura, only to be blocked by the Quasian sorcery. Finally, the technocrats uncorked the big guns. Three tactical nuclear missiles charged with enough prime essence to wipe out a small city launched smoothly from hidden orbital weapons platforms. The missiles, or crudely labeled spirit nukes, wiped out most of the combatants and any civilians left alive in the area. Even after this onslaught, Zapathashura was still standing, but grievously wounded. As the last Quasian Bodhisattva died, the spell holding the sun at bay was broken. The antediluvian died screaming as the light of four suns reduced it to muddy ash. The destruction of Horizon, Doisatep, and Zapathashura triggered an explosion of spirit energy, the Avatar Storm. The Avatar Storm made travel and communication through the Umbra nearly impossible and cut off earthbound mages and technocrats from their strongest leadership at Horizon and Control, respectively. This left the majority of mages to decide their own fate for the first time in decades, to find their own way in a world in which magic was slowly dying. This has been an overview on the history of mages. Thank you for listening. Until next time.